Okay, so this is now the explanation of Buddha Nusati. So the practice is called Buddha Nusati, and of course the first word, this is a compound, the first word means Buddha, or the first word is Buddha, and then the second word is Anusati, which means we translate as recollection. And maybe people think, ah, when we're practicing Buddhist meditation, we should be doing mindfulness, not recollection. But if we look at the word, anusati, you can see that it's a compound. Well, maybe you won't see it as a compound unless you don't follow. <laughs> <laughs> But it's compounded of sati, which is the word that's translated mindfulness, plus the prefix anu. Anu gives the sense of repeated or close. So this is mindfulness, repeated mindfulness, or close mindfulness. And it's directed towards the Buddha, or more precisely, the qualities of the Buddha. And you know, often when people come to Buddhist meditation, particularly Westerners, they think, ah, I don't want that devotional meditation, I want the real thing, you know, mindfulness of breathing, vipassana, sitting three hours, contemplating pain. <laughs> that's the real meditation. <laughs> These devotional meditations, that's for old ladies and old people. <laughs> Not for me. But there's a sutta in which the Buddha says there is one thing that when developed and cultivated leads to peace, direct knowledge, enlightenment, to nirvana. And what is that one thing? The recollection of the Buddha. It doesn't mean that this is the only thing, because the Buddha goes on to mention nine other things, including recollection of the Dhamma, the Sangha, and then I think mindfulness of breathing comes in also. Okay, so this is a meditation that leads, when developed and cultivated, it can lead to enlightenment, can lead to Nibbana. Though not on its own, eventually it has to be supplemented by insight, by wisdom. But basically, recollection of the Buddha is a vehicle, a means, to develop tranquility and samadhi, concentration. The concentration that can then be used as a basis for developing insight or wisdom. Okay, how does recollection of the Buddha contribute to the development of tranquility or samadhi? and then to insight. Okay, there's a sutta that occurs in the Anguttara, uh, also in the Anguttara Nikaya, in which a disciple of the Buddha, a lay disciple named Mahanama, comes to the Buddha and asks how a noble disciple who has arrived at the fruit and understood the teaching often dwells. And so this question, if one understands the kind of terminology of the Dhamma, this is referring to a disciple who is at least a stream interim, because he's arrived at the fruit. This would be the fruit of the path, from stream entry up to the higher stages, and who has understood the teaching, not just intellectually, but through direct realization. So how does that disciple often dwell? And then the Buddha says that this disciple often recollects the Tathagata thus. The Tathagata, of course, is a, another designation for the Buddha. Then we come to the nine qualities of the Buddha that we're going to be going through in a little while. Okay, then he explains how this practice works. Okay, so he says, when a noble disciple recollects the Tathagata recollects the Buddha, on that occasion his or, his or her mind is not obsessed by lust, hatred, or delusion. 
So when one is recollecting the Buddha, one is bringing to mind an object that I would say it's the purest, holiest, the loftiest, most excellent possible human being, the human being who has reached the peak of perfection, whose mind is utterly purified of all defilements. And so when one is bringing that person to mind, then there's very little opportunity for thoughts of lust, hate, or delusion to creep into the mind. You know, <laughs> Okay, when one is practicing mindfulness of breathing, you know, easy for the deep anusias, the underlying tendencies of lust, anger, pride, jealousy, envy, um, misery, all these other thoughts to come into the mind. <laughs> Even though one thinks one is well focused on the object. But when one is recollecting the Buddha, then one has an object which is already extremely pure, extremely holy, extremely well, excellent and perfect in all respects. And so the mind at that time, that sort of object, when one is really focused on the qualities of the Buddha, that focus clears away thoughts of lust, hate or delusion, and then the mind becomes straight, focused on the Tathagata. Okay, then this is the key point. As one is bringing to mind the qualities of the Buddha, then with that straight mind focused on the Tathagata, then one gains a kind of inspiration in the meaning, the meaning of the Buddha's qualities. An inspiration rooted in the Dhamma, because it's the realization of the Dhamma that makes a person a Buddha. And then one gains joy connected with the Dhamma. So this is sort of the key, what I would call like the key to the practice, is that directing the mind to the qualities of the Buddha brings up a feeling of joy. Maybe it doesn't happen immediately, and this is what I find to be the remarkable thing about this practice. I call this a slow practice, not a quick practice. Because what I found in my experience when doing the recollection of the Buddha, sometimes you're going over these qualities again and again, and it seems like you're just <laughs> wasting your time with thoughts when you could be doing a meditation which stills thoughts. But when one ends the meditation and then gets up and starts going about one's activities, one finds, wow, something has happened. Like the mind suddenly it feels very pure, very joyful, and very clear. Okay, but then as one does this repeatedly, again directing the mind to the qualities of the Buddha and when doing so, generating, remember the qualities I mentioned last night, First, esteem and admiration for the qualities of the Buddha. Then turning from that esteem and admiration towards a trusting confidence, especially those people who have taken the three refuges, this is my refuge. This is the one that I've turned to for guidance in living this path of life. Like this is my island in the storm of suffering amongst all of the fluctuations in this life of continued uncertainty, this is sort of my rock of certainty, <laughs> that stable refuge, the harbor, the island, the Buddha. So that brings up this joy, and then as that joy intensifies, then it will turn into pipi, which is an intensified form of joy, and then from this joy comes tranquility. From tranquility comes pleasant feeling or happiness. And then that happiness brings, as that happiness becomes intensified, then the mind becomes concentrated. Samad deity. That's the verb related to the noun samadhi. OK, 
Okay, so that is the basic sort of steps in the development of the recollection of the Buddha. Moving from bringing to mind the qualities again and again. That's why it's anus, anusati. Turning them over again and again. And then as one is turning them over, then one moves the mind, gets the stilled or lust, hate, and delusion sort of subside, fade into the background. The mind becomes straight. Then comes inspiration, joy. Then eventually, maybe not in just a short retreat, piti, uh, basadi, tranquility, samadhi, concentration. Okay, so how does one practice the recollection of the Buddha? How does one actually do it? I lost that. Ah, there they are. Okay. Okay, so the text, the suttas, enumerate nine epithets or qualities of the Buddha, each highlighting a particular different quality of the Buddha. And I compare these different qualities forgive the rather worldly analogy, but it's like, maybe nowadays you wouldn't dare to do this, but having a big plate <laughs> with scoops of nine different flavored ice creams. <laughs> <laughs> so when you have the big plate with, let's say, little spoons of ice cream, <laughs> so you want to get a taste, to, to taste the flavor of each of the different kinds of ice cream. So you take a little scoop of this, ah, that's the taste of chocolate, ah, that's vanilla, that's cherry, that's coffee ice cream, and so on. So each of these epithets has its own sort of distinctive, first it has its meaning, and then through that meaning we get a particular, I call this a flavor, a way to sort of understand and then to appreciate the qualities of the Buddha. And so first I'll explain these qualities. Then what we're going to be doing in the meditation is going through them in a kind of contemplative mode. So first I'm going to just explain them in a purely conceptual way. Okay, so the first of these, we say that iti piso bhagava, the first is Arahan. And the word Arahan that comes from the verb Arahati, which means to be worthy. And the idea here is to be worthy of offering. And this was a concept that was sort of already floating around in pre Buddhist times that it is the person who has achieved the ultimate goal of the spiritual life who is the one who is truly worthy of veneration and offering. And so within the Buddhist framework of interpretation, the one who is truly worthy of veneration and offering is one who has completely eliminated all of the kilesas, all the defilements, of the mind, the one who's completely uprooted greed, hatred, and delusion, or the what's called the asavas, the flowing defilements of sensuality, craving for existence, and ignorance. So one who is completely purified of all defilements and thereby is liberated from the cycle of repeated birth and death. So the Buddha is not unique in being Arahant, since the Buddha's disciples, those who receive the teaching from the Buddha, 
and follow the path to the end also become arahats, arahants. The Buddha discovers the path, teaches it. Those who follow it eradicate the defilements and become ar <coughs> arahants. And then we come to the next quality of the Buddha, which is Sama Sambuddho. So Sama has the sense of perfectly, completely, fully, and Sambuddho is enlightened or wake, awakened. And this is understood to mean one who has removed all of the obstacles to knowledge and fully understands the nature of reality. The commentaries explain Samasambuto as meaning one who has achieved the knowledge of omniscience. Though in the suttas one doesn't find the Buddha making an explicit claim to omniscience. And I, I don't think the Buddha would have known how many <coughs> ants were crawling in the premises of the Buddha's Insight Center <laughs> in March 30th, I think March 30th, mm -hmm. 2019. Or if we put the computer in front of the Buddha and say, <laughs> get this operating system fixed, um, we wouldn't know how to do it. Either. But we can say that the Buddha has understood, the way I understand it, all sort of the principles of constituents of reality and all of the principles relevant to the spiritual, to spiritual development. Okay, then comes third quality is Vija Charana Sampanno. Okay, so the word Vija means knowledge. Again, this is emphasizing knowledge and to make it distinct I use and qualify it clear knowledge and charana means conduct so we can see under conduct the Buddha's behavior that his conduct is always in accordance with the principles of sila non-harming, non-stealing completely celibate in all respects always speaking the truth, and possessing many, many other aspects of excellent conduct. You can find these fully elaborated in it's the Brahmayu Sutta, Sutta number, Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta num 91, I think, where a young Brahmin wants to check out whether the ascetic Gotama is truly an enlightened one, and so he follows the Buddha for ten months, something like this, six months, observing all aspects of his conduct. Then he goes back to his master, the elder Brahman, and reports on the Buddha's conduct. And just on the basis of that report, then the elder Brahman becomes convinced that this is the Buddha. Okay, so we have one who's accomplished and clear knowledge who understands, especially what's mentioned here under clear knowledge, is the understanding or knowledge of his own past lives, millions and millions of past lives, the divine eye through which he can see the passing away and rebirth of beings in accordance with their karma, and then the knowledge of the destruction of the asavas, of the flowing defilement flux of defilements. Okay, the next quality is Sukkato, which, again, it's a compound of Su, which has a sense of good or well, and Gatta is gone. So literally, it's well gone. But it can be maybe translated as one who has gone to good fortune, the fortunate one. And then the way it's explained in the commentaries, it's one who has gone to the good state, that's the blissful state of Nibbana, and one who has gone by the good path, 
That's the Noble Eightfold Path. <coughs> okay. Okay, now we come, the next quality is Loka Vidu, which means Loka is the world, and Vidu is one who knows. So this is a knower of the world. So it's explained that this is one who knows the world in the sense that he knows all the different realms of existence, from the lowest realms, we call these the hell realms, the realms of the afflicted spirits, the animal, different animal types of animals, the human realm, the different heavenly realms, all of these come within the scope of the Buddha's knowledge. He also knows the world in the sense of knowing all the different types of, of conditioned phenomena. So he's analyzed the world by way of the five aggregates, the 18 elements, and so forth. And also who knows the world in the sense of knowing the world of living beings, who knows the minds and hearts of living beings which enables the Buddha to function as an effective teacher. Okay, it's by being a knower of the world, in the sense of knowing the minds and hearts of living beings, that the Buddha, that the next quality comes in, Anuttaro Purisa Dhammasarati, he is the unsurpassed, that's a neutro, trainer, sarati, of persons to be tamed, persons to be trained. So he's one who's able to tame the most difficult and obstinate people. And we see this illustrated if you know the suttas and the narrative literature. We see how the Buddha meets sometimes ascetics who are committed to their austere self-mortification practices and then he's able to transform them and bring them onto his own middle path. He meets proud Brahmins and then with a discourse he's able to subdue their pride and bring them onto his path. He meets people who are afflicted with misery and distress and with consoling words and uplifting words, he's able to uplift their spirits and then bring them onto the path. And perhaps the paradigm case is that of the Buddha's encounter with Angulimala, the serial killer. And the Buddha, through his skillful means, transforms Angulimala, makes him a monk, and then Angulimala becomes an arhat. So, you find many, many stories which illustrate how the Buddha was the supreme or unsurpassed trainer of persons <coughs> to be tamed. Okay, the next quality is a sort of an extension of this. So the Buddha, or a generalization of this, the Buddha is called Sattā Deva Manusāna. So he is the teacher of devas, those are the divine beings, the gods, celestial beings, and human beings. So if, again, when you read the suttas, one finds quite a number of suttas in which in the middle of the night the devas come from the heavenly realms, they come down into the human realm to visit the Buddha. When everybody else is asleep, they come and then approach the Buddha and ask questions to the Buddha. And sometimes the Buddha goes to the celestial realms in order to teach the devas. So he teaches the deities as well as human beings. And as a teacher, his function is to point out what is harmful and what is beneficial, and to guide beings to the good. Okay, the next quality of the Buddha is called Buddha. 
which is the enlightened one. So this sometimes can raise the question, what is the relationship? Here, he's called Samasambuddho, one who's perfectly enlightened. And here, Buddha, the enlightened one. So I pondered this question, and this is my personal interpretation, that Samasambuddho is one who is himself enlightened. Buddha is one who is not only himself enlightened, but this is also one whose function is to enlighten others, to awaken the light of wisdom in others. So we can say Buddha is the enlightener, the awakener. And then we come to the ninth quality, which is what's the ninth designation, which is Bhagava, difficult word to exactly translate. Um, so I followed earlier translators in using the word blessed one. If you take out fortunate one, what we use as the super term. Okay, but this doesn't mean that there's somebody like a higher supreme being that's blessed the Buddha. <laughs> but the way I understand this and explain this is that the Buddha is the one who has acquired, who possesses all excellent and mer meritorious qualities. And then by b acquiring all of those blessed qualities, he extends his waves of blessing out to the world. So the word Bhagava, each of the spiritual traditions uses the word Bhagava for their own chosen divine being. So the Vaishnavites, the, the school of Hinduism, call Krishna Bhaga, Bhagava. So we have the Bhagavad Gita, the song of the Bhagava, which is the song of Krishna, <coughs> but not for Buddhists. <laughs> and then I guess the Shaivites will call Shiva Bhagava, and the followers of Ramana Mahashi call Ramana Mahashi Bhagava. I remember years ago there was a teacher later called Osho, they called him Bhagava Rajneesh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we call the Buddha Bhagava. Okay, so those are the nine, a brief explanation of the nine epithets of the Buddha. Um, maybe if I, there are any practical questions, we could just devote a few minutes to them. We don't want to go into theoretical questions. Um, I had a translation question about the previous sutta extract. Um, yeah. You had translated the phrase as something like, those who are balanced amidst those yeah, who are unbalanced? Yeah, yeah. What's the word that you're translating? It's balance? summa. summa. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so no... <laughs> you want to stand up and sort of stretch before we go into the actual practice? We could do just some very quick things. 